Hello and welcome to a new series I am loosely calling Labs, or in this case, Bevy Labs, because this is going to be about Bevy. In many software projects, there are features that are merged to main or under experimental flags or released as alphas or betas. And I'm going to label those videos in the future under the Labs category or the Labs playlist or whatever I choose to do with it. So that it's clear that I'm talking about something that is either merged or in an alpha state or experimental state and is not yet in a stable release. So for Bevy, what this means is Bevy does a release every three months or approximately every three months and PRs get merged in during those three months. Anything that has not gone out in a stable release yet will fall under the labs category and anything under an experimental flag like meshlets will also fall under that labs category. This is just to set expectations because what we're talking about today is the 2D depth buffer or depth texture, which is on the main branch of Bevy and not in a stable release until 0 0.15. So what are we actually talking about today? We're talking about mesh 2D improvements. This is the issue that sort of organizes all of the work that's going on there. Ice Sentry is being responsible for a bunch of it or all of it in this case. And specifically what we see here is a number of PRs. We don't really care about the first one right now. It was work to enable the second one. The second one is a 2D opaque phase with a depth buffer. Today we're gonna cover the depth buffer specifically. Binning was then enabled for the 2D opaque phase, which we will talk about in a second, what, what that means and what effects it can have. And then the alpha mask 2D is also already merged, but we're not gonna talk about it today. So the first thing to talk about is what is a depth texture at all? And the easiest way to bring that up is to look at the 3D examples. Specifically, this is the shader pre-pass example in the Bevy repo. And you can see there's three cubes here with different images projected onto them. And why are we looking at this? Because it gives us a really easy way to visualize the depth texture of this scene. And you can see that the depth texture is basically just a PNG with values from zero to one. So zero being all the black background, being infinitely far away from the camera and closer to the camera, getting closer to the value one. So you can see that the corner back here up in the middle of the screen is darker than the corner down here, which is very close to the camera. And this black and white texture can be written to from fragment shaders. So while we don't have a pre-pass for this in 2D, we do have access to the depth texture and we'll see that in Xcode in a little bit. But fundamentally, the idea of a depth texture is if you take your entire scene, there is a distance from the camera for each pixel in the scene. And if you visualize that depth, it looks like this. So that brings us to our example today. This is the 2D example that we're going to be using. We're using the same icon we just saw with a transparent background. This is the Bevy logo. On the left hand side here, you can see that it is tinted green, which is what we're doing in the shader, which we'll talk about in a second. The code here is mostly a straight copy and paste from the Material 2D example in the Bevy repo. That's done for educational purposes, so you don't have to learn anything very new and special. But basically what we have here is a Material Mesh 2D bundle on the left and the right. So one up here on the left, one up here on the right. Our material is defined below. We pass in a color, in this case it's green 400 from the Tailwind palette, and a color texture. This texture is the icon PNG that you can see here that we just saw over here, and that gets passed into our shader. And then below that, we have two sprites. We use sprite bundles. All we're doing is passing in the icon as the texture and positioning them left and right. So we've got a mesh 2D, a mesh 2D with materials on them, and then a sprite and a sprite. Now, one thing you see immediately here is that the sprites aren't fighting at all, even though they have the same Z index here. While the two meshes, are absolutely fighting over which one gets to win these pixels. And that brings us into the Bevy code a little bit. If you look at the Bevy Sprite source mesh 2D mesh.rs file, you can see that the mesh 2D render plugin adds some systems to the render. And these are batch and prepare binned render phases for opaque, all right, for <laughs> batch and prepare binned render phases for opaque 2D and alpha mask 2D, which are the two new ones that we were uh, looking at earlier. And then the transparent 2D is a sorted render phase. Why is this important? Because binned can be parallelized, which means that there's no given order, which is why we see that fighting. Whereas the sprites are sorted. So you can see in Q sprites here in Bevy sprite render mod.rs that we're accessing the resource for the draw functions for the transparent 2D phase. And as we'll see in a second, that's when the sprites are drawn. So the sprites are sorted and the mesh 2Ds are not sorted which 
is what results in this little fighting here. So let's cancel this and let's go take a look at this running inside of Xcode, which I just crashed. Yay. <laughs> okay, so we've got a project set up here in Xcode. Uh, if I click down and go to edit scheme, you can see that I've just pointed it at the binary that we have built inside of that project that we just ran. So all we're doing here is using Xcode to run our project, run our binary. This isn't doing any special builds. It's not doing anything special in terms of setup or anything like that. It's just running our binary. And you can see our project running on the right hand side. This is our project running in debug mode. What we can do inside of Xcode is if we go to the debug menu and we choose capture GPU workload, we can actually see that it kind of freezes here because we've captured the workload and we're staring at it. Uh, you'll see a little beach ball if you run your uh, mouse over the application. So if we just kind of expand Xcode and take a look here, we can see a whole bunch of stuff from the GPU. In particular, we've got a main opaque pass 2D and a main transparent pass 2D. The main opaque pass 2D you can see has some output here. And if we click into the opaque pass, we can see a whole bunch of different commands that are be effectively being sent to the GPU. So we've got set vertex buffer, set fragment buffer, a couple of draw indexed primitives. So the first one will be for the first mesh 2D. The second one will be for the second mesh 2D, which you can see pop up here. And then if we go look at the transparent pass, we can see the draw indexed primitives draw the sprites in in the transparent 2D pass. This is how we know that this is happening in opaque versus transparent. And this matters because if we look at, let's say the end here, we can actually see our depth texture on the right. And our depth texture is just all zeros. We're not writing any depth yet. The sprites don't write depth and our current shader for our meshes don't write depth. So taking a look at our shader and what it's actually doing, we've got a couple of bindings. If you've never seen shader code, this might seem a little bit overwhelming. In this case, all we have is an incoming color, a texture and a way to sample that texture. So our texture is the icon PNG, the samplers, how we're going to sample it and the UVs which are coordinates from zero to one for the entire quad that we're drawing, gives us a location which we can use a built-in function called texture sample to grab the appropriate pixel value for that location in the image. So if we drew our image over the entire screen here, zero, zero would be in the top left, one, one would be in the bottom right, and we would get the color from that icon PNG here. Now, the output for this function is something I just called frag out. Uh, this can be named whatever you want, it doesn't matter. It's just some struct that contains a couple of values. In this case, we've got at location zero, a color that is a VEC4 of F32s and a built-in frag depth, which we've called depth at F32. If you're confused as to how I found those or what else is available, you can go to the WGSL spec, which has a section called built-in inputs and outputs. And if you look at the built-in inputs and outputs, you can see that there's position, which has, for example, a vertex and a fragment value, whether it's an input or an output and what type it is. Uh, in this case, the thing that we care about is frag depth, which is available in the fragment stage, which is an output value. So we are returning this as part of our output and it is an F32, usually a value from zero to one. There's a whole bunch of other stuff here that we don't care about, but this is a list of that kind of stuff. So frag depth is a built-in that is an F32 Color is a location that will get painted to our texture. And in this case, all we're doing is setting that color to the color of the icon PNG mixed with that green color that we passed in and we're returning that. Also, you can go check out sprite.wgsl, which is the shader that's used for rendering sprites. It's got a vertex input, a vertex output, which has a bunch more locations and values and things like that. It's a little bit more complicated, but at the end of the day, it's doing basically the same thing. Take some color, sample it from some sprite texture using the UVs, a sampler, and a given image. It also has some support for tone mapping and then return the color. So this location zero VEC4 F32 is the color that we're returning in our shader as well. You'll notice that this doesn't write to the depth texture at all. That's why we're not seeing it when we look at the depth texture inside of Xcode in our GPU snapshot. That's why this whole image on the right here is black, it's zero because sprites don't write. That rhymes, I probably should use that. <laughs> so if we run this again, we want some way to determine what is going to be on top of what here. And in our case, what I've chosen to do, if I save this, it'll show up. What I've chosen to do is take the color.r value, and if it's less than 0 0.5, we will kind of compress that 
over 2. So if it's less than 0 0.5, it'll be a value from 0 to 0.25. And that gets written out to our depth here. Otherwise, the depth is 1. Now, it's, it's pretty easy to see which pieces we're operating on if we also add a different color. So if I save this and we set the color output to red for the section that we're kind of like compressing down and setting to the depth, you can see that's all of this other stuff. And the color that we are kind of promoting to the front here is just this top bird. So if we take those color overrides away again, you can see that while the sprites overlay on top of each other, using the depth texture, we can actually define which pixels are closer to the camera and which pixels are further away. It's also worth noting them using kind of like pixels and fragments in the same general vibe here for this video. So in this case, what we're doing is we're setting this grayscale, including this background circle color to be the furthest away from the camera. We're setting this kind of like darkest bird to be slightly closer. This bird is slightly closer and this bird is all the way on top, which is why we see this bird on top of that bird and the colors in the back, the circle, like the darkest circle aren't like none of this is competing because we have a defined order with this depth value. And these are values again from zero to one. In this case, it's zero to 0.25 because of how we've defined it. And then we set the top to an arbitrary one. Now we can set this bird to other values. We can kind of push it back as well. So in here, we've chosen a value 0 0.02, which just happens to be behind this back bird, but in front of the back circle. And again, that just happens to be how the color works out. This is arbitrary, but we're gonna leave this back at one to see that bird over the other bird. And we can run our Xcode again with what looks like our new output here with the depth texture applied or the depth value set more like. And if we capture the GPU workload, we go back to our opaque pass, we can now see that the depth texture is getting filled out for both of these. So on the left-hand side, you can see the green tinted version of the mesh 2Ds, which is the color we're outputting. And on the right-hand side, you can see the depth texture being applied. And you can see that the back color is 0 0.01, which is not quite black. We've got 0 0.09 for the darkest bird. We've got 0 0.22 for the next darkest bird which makes sense because we said any value that's below 0 0.5, we cut in half. So the maximum value is 0 0.25. And then for the bird on top, it's one. But if we go check the sprites, you can see they don't write to the depth texture and therefore do not have a value in the depth texture. So this is why we want to use mesh 2Ds if we're trying to take advantage of that depth texture and these depth writes. And we can define however we want to define what will get placed in front of something else. And just to repeat it, this is from using the frag depth built in, which we've defined as depth. We have our output here defined as the frag out type. We are defining the depth for an arbitrary fragment. We can do this however we want. And it's worth noting that even though we have these material mesh 2D bundles with Z indices or Z values, so zero and one here, if we don't write to the depth texture, then these are both gonna be zero and they're gonna fight for that spot. Whereas if we write to the depth texture with the values that we want them to have, they will be shown over other values. So in this way, you can take two different sprites and you can define different pixels for which they will intersect, which allows say one sprite to walk through another or more advanced techniques. Now, one thing you may have noticed is that this black color is still there. And for that, we can just say if the color in the alpha is less than 0 0.5. In this case, it'll be something close to zero. We can just discard those fragments and we get our alpha mask back. So that's it. This is what a depth texture does. You can define kind of the depth of the scene for any given pixel, and that will cause any, say, mesh 2Ds that have that depth applied to be sorted and chosen instead of the pixels that are behind it. In this case, we've chosen the front bird to be the topmost pixel. So the top bird will overlay over this back bird while the back of this circle will overlay or underlay behind it. And this is different than the way that sprites work currently because sprites are very lightweight and they don't have as many features as a mesh 2D. Now, if we look back at the tracking issue, that may not be true forever as the last item in this list is switched to using mesh 2D as a backend for sprites. So one day mesh 2Ds may back sprites, but again, this is a labs video, so we don't know if that's going to happen yet. 
or when it does, if it will. Now, why is this really interesting? Because you can do more complicated things with the depth texture. So in this example, I have a player character that is a mesh 2D. I have this kind of archway, which is a single tile sitting on top of a whole bunch of other tiles. So this is an isometric, you know, 2D tile based uh, a game or app. Um, I know I have performance metrics in the top right. Don't pay too much attention to those because I'm also running OBS, Blender, and a whole bunch of other stuff on my computer right now. But note that the player can walk through this archway because this left side of the arch and the right side of the arch are the same image. And it can be in front over here and behind over here. And this is attributed to the depth texture. In this case, I've faked 3D depth textures. So I've rendered out something that makes it look like it would be 3D. That is not necessary though. So this sort of thing is really interesting. It has some really interesting implications for how you can do 2D tile-based sorting or isometric sorting, isometric being slightly harder than just 2D. And you can do just kind of whatever you want with this depth texture. Now it's notable that we don't have a pre-pass like we saw earlier and there's still work to be done, but I'll put this code up. I'll link it in the description and hopefully that helped because people asked for this video. <laughs> And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.